Hello AQA and OCR students, what a great video this is for you guys as I go through some tricky little multiple choice questions that require key equations, key conditions, key knowledge that are often major gaps. Make sure though guys that you've watched my key equations and conditions video. I can't stress enough just how important that video is to really nail your multiple choice questions. These are gifts from the gods, these questions. We want to do well in them. So also make sure you've watched my prior videos about tricky multiple choice questions. They're all in my revision for paper three videos playlist. Go and check them out and we're good to go. Let's dive into question one, a tricky little question about the multiplier. What a great question this is, one that really makes you think. So in an economy, the marginal propensity to consume is 0.6. I would immediately underline that because that's going to be crucial information, key information always worth highlighting like that. All other things being equal, which one of the following statements is going to be correct? Well, as soon as I see MPC and a figure for it, I'm thinking multiplier. So on the right, some key equations to remember. When you have the MPC, this is the multiplier equation you'll need. One over one minus the MPC to get the multiplier. And for the change in national income, once you have the multiplier number, you just take the initial injection multiplied by the multiplier. That's going to be helpful, actually, for two of these answers. So you can you see B and C, they give you injections. Uh, 20 billion, 10 billion, they give you a change in national income. So by going through these equations, we can see whether B and C are correct. So let's first work out, work out the multiplier. So multiplier in this case is going to be 1 over 1 minus 0 0.6. That's 1 over 0 0.4. Play that through, that's 2.5. That's the value of the multiplier. So now let's see if B and C are correct. Well, B initial injections are 20 billion. So multiply 20 by the multiply 2.5, that's going to give us 50 billion. Well, not 32, so B is wrong. Part C, injections are 10 billion. We'll multiply that by 2.5, you get 25 billion. Increase in national income, not 6. So C is wrong. So really the multiplier and national income change, not relevant for this question. B and C are wrong. A and D are testing knowledge of what the MPC actually means. What is the marginal propensity to consume? Do you know what that means? That's what A and D are then testing. So know that the marginal propensity to consume is simply the willingness to spend any extra income earned. The willingness to spend extra income. So in this situation, if the MPC is 0 0.6, it means for any change of income, there'll be a 60% change in consumption. The key is the word change. So have a look at D. When the economy's national income is 100 billion, consumption will equal 60. Well, this has to be wrong because there is no concept of change. There is no change in national income, which will then lead to a change in consumption. So D is wrong. That's not what marginal propensity to consume is all about. Whereas look at A. A 5 billion reduction in the economy's national income, well, there's a change, will mean a 3 billion fall in consumption. This is correct because we have a change in income and then a 60% reduction in consumption. 3 billion fall out of 5 billion is 60%. That is going to be correct because we're looking at change, the idea of change. Brilliant question, testing your knowledge of marginal, that word marginal, oh yes, that's why the answer is A great question that one. So you see it's all about the word marginal. These little things are so important for multiple choice questions. Just like for this next question a lot of students have no idea what this question is all about. What's going on? Let's check it out shall we? Yes what a rip snorter of a question. This is an absolute beauty. Let's dive straight in shall we? Well it's one of those classic diagram questions which start with a load of waffle some lines that simply describe what the diagram is showing, but we have eyes, right? God has given us eyes, eyes whereby we can see things. We can see what the diagram is showing us. We don't need to waste our time with these few lines. The actual question is down below, all the way over here. If the firm increases its price by 10% from P1, what's gonna happen? Well, at the crux of this question, it's knowing that PED varies along a straight line demand curve. On the right, I've drawn a straight line demand curve. The idea is the top half, demand is price elastic, PD is greater than one. The further up you are, the higher the number is. The extreme end, uh, demand is perfectly price elastic, infinity. And the bottom half, PD is less than one, demand is price inelastic, the extreme end, demand is perfectly price inelastic. Simple reason why in the top half, the percentage change in QD is always gonna be greater than the percentage change in P. Look at the x-axis here. We're moving from very low numbers on the q-axis from 0 to 1, 1 to 2. These are very, very high percentage changes will dominate whatever the percentage change in price was. 
on the bottom half, it's the opposite. The percentage change in P is going to dominate the percentage changes in QD. Again, look at the y-axis now. We're moving from very low numbers on the price axis, 0 to 1, 1 to 2, etc. These are huge uh, percentage changes in P will dominate whatever the fall in QD was as a percentage change. That's a simple reason why the midpoint of the line PD is unit price elastic is 1. So knowing that, we can eliminate A and B. If we look at A, price elasticity of demand will decrease as a firm increases price. Well, whenever you increase price, PED is going up in terms of number, right? It's not coming down. If you decrease price, it's coming down in number. You increase price, you're going up in number. So PED will not decrease when you raise price. It will increase. So A is clearly wrong. B is saying PED will not change. Well, why they're saying PED does change along a straight line demand curve. So that is wrong. Also, you need to know that the midpoint of the line here corresponds with revenue maximization. So revenue max occurs when MR is zero, right? We know that. So we're saying when MR is zero, revenue is maximized, TR is maximized. That corresponds with the midpoint of the line when PED is equal to one, equal to unit price elasticity. Let's understand why that's the case. Well, we know that whenever demand is either price elastic or price inelastic, there is always a price change that will increase total revenue. So for example, when demand is price elastic, we know that a fall in price will increase TR, whereas when demand is price inelastic, an increase in price will increase TR. So when demand is price elastic or price inelastic, you can't be maximizing TR because there is always a price change that will lead to higher total revenue. So therefore, the only time when total revenue is maximized is when there is no price change that can increase total revenue, i.e. demand is neither price elastic nor is it price inelastic, and that occurs only when demand is unit price elastic, when PD is equal to one. That's why it corresponds with revenue max when MR is zero. That's gonna help us answer C and D. So we now know that, look, at P1, we are on the price elastic portion of the demand curve, the higher portion of the demand curve. We know that now because we know the midpoint is where MR is zero. So if we're on the price elastic portion of the demand curve at P1, if a firm increases its price by 10%, we know revenue is going to fall. The answer is C. Revenue is not going to rise. You see? Nice question there. An absolute beauty. But knowing all of this, we can smash this question and get it right regardless. Damn, that's interesting stuff. Beautiful, beautiful stuff. Hopefully a gap covered there just like for this next question. Do you guys know about the average rate of tax and marginal rate of tax and the different types of income tax systems? Well, you better do for this question. Yes, another great question here. A stunner, really, really making you think about some important ideas and concepts. So which one of the following is correct for a proportional tax on income? Well, that's a key term right there. Underline that to keep our mind focused. And then a lot of the answers are going into marginal rate of tax, average rate of tax. So let's start by understanding what they are. So the average rate of tax is simply the amount of tax paid as a proportion of income earned. It's a percentage. So if the ART is 20%, it means that 20% of income that's being earned is going in income tax. And then the MRT, the marginal rate of tax, is simply the amount of tax paid as a proportion of any extra income earned. Again, it's a percentage rate. So if the figure is 40%, it means that 40% of extra income earned is going in income tax. That's all they mean. And now we need to understand what a proportional tax is. Well, another name for a proportional income tax is a flat tax. And all that is, is whereby all income earned is being taxed at the same rate. So no matter how much you're earning, the income tax rate is always the same. So let's say that tax rate is 20%. So no matter what you're earning, the income tax rate is always going to be 20%. So in that situation, the average rate of tax is going to be constant at the flat rate, at the flat rate. Right, so if the flat rate, the proportional tax rate is 20%, the average rate of tax is 20%, your income is always going to be taxed at 20%. So the amount of tax paid as a proportion of your income is always going to be 20%. And that's going to be always equal to the marginal rate of tax because any extra income earned is always going to be taxed at 20%. So knowing that, we can eliminate B, C and D straight away. So B, the marginal rate of tax is lower than the average rate. We just said they're equal, so B is wrong. The average rate of tax falls as income increases. No, we said the average rate of tax is constant regardless of what's happening with income. If income rises or falls, the average rate of tax is always going to be at that proportional rate, at that flat rate. 
and D, the average rate of tax is lower than the marginal rate. No, they're equal. So the answer has to be A. Let's understand why. The amount of tax paid increases as income increases. Of course, we're saying the rate is constant, but the amount of tax paid is going to rise naturally. If the rate is 20%, then 20% of a high income of a high number is going to be a high number compared to 20% of a low income of a low number, right? So the amount of tax you pay rises, but the rate is constant. And just before we finish, note what a progressive income tax is. So a progressive income tax system is one where as income rises, the average rate of tax rises because as people earn more, they normally are pushed up into higher tax bands. So the average rate of tax can rise. And for that reason too, the marginal rate of tax can also rise, okay? So there you go, tricky little question here, key concepts you need to know. Now you know them, happy, happy days. Well, there we go, another gap covered. This is pure gold dust for you guys. And now the final question, crucial equations needed to work out real GDP and real GDP per capita. Can you believe so many students don't know about these equations? What the heck is going on? We need to be able to, let's do it. So yes, I had to put this question in to ensure that you guys know your crucial real GDP and real GDP per capita equations. Now in truth, it is possible to do this question without the equations and the formal process. But just in case you get a question in paper three where you do need the equations and you do need the formal process, I'm gonna do this question properly with the equations and the methodology to help you. Now, always in paper three, there is at least one question where you need these equations. So important to know this well. Let's dive in. So it's another one of those questions with data. The first few lines, utter nonsense. It's waffle, right? Describing what our eyes can see. We can see what the table is showing us. We don't need to waste our time reading this utter nonsense at the start. Let's use our eyes to work all that out. The question is way down here. From the data, it can be concluded that between year one, year two, real GDP per capita has done what? So we need to work out real GDP per capita in year two. Go to the equations. Real GDP is simply nominal GDP divided by a price index times 100. To make your life easy, keep all numbers in index form here. For real GDP per capita, take your real GDP equation, divide by a population index times 100. Again, all numbers in index form. To convert numbers to index, this is the equation you need. Take the raw number you want to convert, divide by the raw number in the base year, multiply by 100, you get your index number. So first thing here, convert numbers into index form. Well, our price index is already in index form. That's helpful, but convert all the others. Now we know when you see 100, that must be the base year. Year one is the base year. Even if you don't know that, you're not told that, or you haven't got an index number of 100, always the first year when there are two years is always the base year. That's your comparison point. So all numbers in the base year will have an index number of 100. Simple. Now convert 22 to 20 into index number as well. So 22 divided by 20 times 100 is 110. 220 divided by 200 times 100 is also 110. Now plonk these numbers into our real GDP per capita equation. So real GDP per capita in year two is just going to be Nominal GDP, 110, divided by our price index, also 110, times 100. That's just going to give us 100, divided by our population index, which is 110. Multiply all of that by 100, and you get a number, which is 90.9. Use your calculator, 90.9. So that is real GDP per capita in year two. Now, in the base year, in the base year, year one, right, real GDP per capita as an index number is 100. Whereas now in year two, it's 90.9. What's that? 9.1% reduction, isn't it? So we know immediately the answer is A. Real GDP per capita has fallen. That's how you do it with the equations of the formal process. You need to know these equations. Get it in. You'll see how easy that is and you'll be able to get these questions correct. Yes, we have these equations in. Happy days. A lot of students don't know these equations. You do now. Well, we know these equations now, and that is a great video. Just plugging all these major gaps for you. Tricky little questions, not anymore. Just make sure, guys, again, you've watched my key equations and conditions video. You've watched all my prior multiple choice questions videos too, where I plug gaps for you. I don't just pick correct answers and move on. I'll tell you why they're correct and what the process is. So helpful as we move into paper three now. So yeah, check all those videos out. Be confident, be ready to smash these multiple choice questions, these gifts. I want you guys to score full marks for sure. Hopefully you can now. To be confident, to be happy is the key. So thank you so much for watching, guys. Go hard, go strong, smash this paper three now. Thanks for watching.